Greetings, and welcome back to the podcast. This episode, we are joined by Mr. Derek Evans, CEO of Meg Energy, a TSX-listed energy company with a market cap of approximately $7 billion. Mr. Evans was appointed as the president, CEO, and director in August of 2018, and is a veteran of the energy industry with approximately 40 years of experience. From May 2009 to March 2018, Mr. Evans served as the president, CEO, and director of Pengrowth Energy, where he led the company through a transformation, streamlining its asset base from 35 properties down to two growth assets with over $9 billion of development opportunities. Prior to joining Pengrowth, Mr. Evans was the president, CEO, and director of Focus Energy Trust, a dividend-paying royalty trust company. During his time at Focus, Mr. Evans was successful in increasing the market valuation approximately five times while distributing more than $400 million to unit holders. Mr. Evans holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Mining Engineering from Queen's University and is a registered professional engineer in Alberta. Among other things, we discuss the impact of empowering employees with $2 decisions, a look back at the Renaissance energy days, and why low costs are important in the energy business. Enjoy. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. This episode is brought to you by Canada Action, whose aim is to promote the importance of Canada's energy industry, which is the bedrock of our nation's economy, providing hundreds of thousands of jobs and economic opportunities across the country. Learn more at CanadaAction.ca or check out Canada Action on social media. This podcast is sponsored by HeadRacingCanada.com. In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, HeadRacingCanada.com is now offering free shipping on European factory performance ski gear. By passing brick-and-mortar savings on to customers, HeadRacingCanada.com offers the lowest pricing available in Canada. Check out HeadRacingCanada.com for more info and get your new ski gear for the season. Good afternoon, Mr. Derek Evans. Thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate your time, and I know the listeners will too. Well, thank you, Trevor. I, I think probably the thing I should say right out of the shoots is, just by way of a warning, I'm a linear thinking engineer with very low emotional intelligence. So anything I say, I hope, doesn't offend anybody, and they will take into account uh, the, uh, the disclaimer that I've just put out there. Well... I know a lot of people will appreciate your time. You are also one of the most requested guests from the past episodes. Uh, two or three executives from the show have brought up your name. My neighbor brought up your name. Finally, this guy's parted with uh, the intro from Chris Libicki, So, Well, um, I, I can't imagine who would uh, suggest me to uh, do something like this. I'm delighted. I, I understand this is like episode 157, so... Thank you for um, undertaking and doing this and, and providing an opportunity for some of us in the business to share our thoughts and opinions. You're from a pretty successful family too. I gather uh, your brothers were Olympians. Another brother was a chairman at Goldman Sachs and your dad was a professor at the U of T. So something in the water. <laughs> That's uh, uh, interesting. So I am the black sheep of the family. Um, I grew up, I've got three other brothers and two sisters and grew up in Ontario, came out West when I was 14 years old to work on a ranch and I never looked back. Um, there's something about the Calgary environment and the oil and gas business. It's incredibly entrepreneurial. Nobody wants to know where you went to school or who your mother or who your father was. It's what are you capable of doing and what sort of impact can you have? And um, I can tell you, I have never regretted the fact that I decided to not only make my home, but my career in Western Canada. Two things I 
forgot my notes today, so this will be carb launch. Uh, and the other thing is I'm overdressed once again, so apologies. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but just uh, to correct a couple of, uh, not correct, but to, uh, you know, so uh, yes, I did have two brothers that were Olympians, but they would be the first to tell you that was the year in which the Russians didn't show up. Um, so a somewhat less competitive uh, set of Olympics. And my father, who was a great influence in my life, you know, I was president of the University of Toronto, held a variety of other jobs. But the key thing that he left me with was you should change your job every six or seven years. Um, you should look for a new challenge. You should look for a way to re-energize yourself as opposed to just making some changes when you when you join a company and doing something else and then plateauing out at year seven. Said you need to give yourself a good swift kick in the butt every six or seven years and find something that you can go out and have some impact on. Your other brother was a uh, pre-senior at Goldman Sachs? So I have a, that the Olympic rowers are twins. They both ended up at uh, Goldman Sachs. One left before the other. The other went on to have a very senior role at Goldman Sachs. Um, his twin brother now runs a private equity company in London. Um, well... I thought for the purposes of our conversation today, we could structure it in two halves, a little bit about Meg and some current events, but the first half, maybe just to rewind the clock if, to mm -hmm. the 90s, the Renaissance days. Well, I mean, the, the Renaissance days were... Some of the most amazing and informative days of, of my career. I joined the company when I think it was about... Oh, I can't remember whether it was six or 8,000 BOEs a day with an incredible group of people. And over, over my tenure there, which was right until we sold the company to, um, Husky, we grew it to about the equivalent of 250,000 barrels a day. And the most important part of the, I would say the, the journey was not, not the, the production that we achieved or the fact that we sold a very good company and moved it on to, uh, to Husky, but it was the amazing group of people that uh, I had the opportunity to work with in and in all sorts of capacities. And when I look out at uh, those people that um, I worked hand in hand and side by side with, and I look at the number of them that have become uh, senior individuals, uh, CEOs or COOs of organizations, I can get um, well into uh, somewhere between 15 and 20. And that to me is, that to me is the sign of a really great company is when you develop leaders that can go on um, outside of uh, the structure, the existing structure and uh, do uh, amazing and impactful things um, as they, as they move forward. Maybe just to set the scene, it was the nineties, the stream of capital, so to speak, was starting to become a river. But for the listener, what was Renaissance Energy? Renaissance Energy was probably uh, the number one exploitation company um, in the business. We kept on buying assets from majors and developing them, whereas previously they had arrived at a exploitation sort of plan that – was not going to recover all of the oil um, or natural gas in place. And it really, I think we, we grew off of a belief, uh, a prevailing belief that I think large oil and gas companies had that, you know, a couple of wells in a homogeneous reservoir would drain the whole thing. I, I, uh, some of us didn't believe in homogeneous reservoirs um, and understood very clearly and succinctly that despacing or dropping the spacing down, drilling more wells, you were going to find accumulations of either oil or gas that was not going to be recovered. And sometimes you were going to get Get surprised and find something completely different. So the the other sort of unique aspect of, of, of Renaissance Energy was it played at the two dollar table in Las Vegas. It was a very empowered organization. So no one decision call that the $2 decision, was going to break the company. And therefore, you could empower people and you could have a very flat bureaucracy. And that is where people got the most amazing experience in terms of making decisions, very quickly seeing whether those decisions worked out. And when you were drilling somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 wells a year, you got an amazing data set of what works, what doesn't work. 
how to make decisions. Um, you know, and the, one of the analogies we, we constantly used with ourselves and with new employees. Okay. This decision, is it going to put a hole in the boat below the waterline at the waterline or above the waterline? The below the water lines, those are ones you should probably go and talk to somebody else. The act, well, you should think about it. But the above the water line, you should take that risk and drive forward. One of the key figures was Mr. Clayton Moitis. How impactful on your career was he and to the company in general? He was amazing. He had, well, that, I would say he was amazing on well, many different levels, um, but I'm going to give you three. And the most important one, I think, is his ability to lead people. I mean, he would literally uh, wander around the halls. He could stop in your office. He would ask you, he said, what do you think about this? What should we be doing here? Then he would get out, um, you know, he'd look at the set of logs that you were looking at and said, well, what happens if we did this? didn't never told you what to do but had enough um sort of insight into the business and kept a close enough eye on what was going on uh that um he could be very impactful not so much impactful from a uh, sort of micromanaging thing but impactful from getting you to think about different things and his leadership he was extraordinary in that regard he also i think did he, you know, he was probably the number one person that didn't believe in the homogeneous reservoir and, you know, was always pushing the boundaries about what we could do and getting us to think in that way. And the third thing I would say is that he was an amazing communicator with the street and how he told the story. Very, very successful uh, individual. And, uh, you know, learned a ton working with him. Did you realize at the time that you were working with not the average Joe in terms of energy leaders and business leaders? You know, it, it's really interesting. He was, you know, there are some, uh, I got to be careful here, but there are some business leaders that think of themselves very, very highly. Um, <laughs> and that wasn't Clayton by any stretch of the imagination. I could walk into his office at any time. I could have a conversation. I remember once I was going to a meeting at Nova and it was cold. It was really cold. And we were in some office building on the east side of town. And he's going, where are you going? I said, well, I've got to go to Nova. And Nova was on the west side of town. And he's going, well, how are you getting there? I mean, he says, walking. And he says, where's your coat? And I said, I don't have a coat. <laughs> he gives me his coat to wear to this meeting. I, it, he, he was a very down to earth, unpretentious leader, which you know, I hope some of that rubbed off on who I am as well in terms of how I lead. It was a unique time in the industry, kind of like I had mentioned, because the capital was growing rapidly. Were you aware of that aspect at Renaissance? Did you notice things were going crazy and that you're drilling so many wells? Did you get a sense that it was a real busy time in the AA sector or were you just trying to learn as much as you can? You know, it, to a certain extent, at, at that stage of my career, I think I was somewhat, you know, I was um, I was an exploitation engineer, reservoir engineer, and um, I was so busy trying to keep up with the day-to-day -day work. You know, I knew that the, the fundraising, that capital was going to be there. But my job was not to spend a lot of time being aware of that, but to continue to bring either acquisition opportunities or, you know, further sort of development opportunities inside the existing asset base that they will everybody was very focused and played their position but you know by virtue of the fact that we were growing and we were growing as quickly as we can um you know we were certainly spending far more than our cash flow and I think on average we probably did an equity issue a year for a period of time were you aware of that characteristic of the business at the time that perhaps Sometimes people got ahead of themselves in terms of creating value in the business. And although it was a really busy time, you had to balance that with making actual profits. Or did you take time to learn that? You know, it, it, it's an interesting question, uh, Trevor, because I think at that point in time, I thought the capital, uh, I, you know, shareholder capital was being deployed in a very effective, cost effective manner. I thought we were creating value for shareholders. It was only later on in my career that, um, I began to question the quality of inventory, um, in companies and say to myself, you know, does the business model need to change? Should all of, uh, cash flow be completely reinvested or should we be providing some of that back to shareholders. In the end, if I'm correct, Renaissance merged with Husky. Mm -hmm. When you think back on it, was that the right decision? 
Um, yeah, uh, yes. And not for the reasons that you probably think it is. I talked a little bit about, um, what I thought, uh, Renaissance greatest asset was, and it's, it's, it was its people. And I, I, I think the most amazing thing to me as having been a participant inside the company is to have watched the, the impact and how those people Eventually, they never stayed at Husky. They all moved on and did different things. And that is the legacy of, of, of Renaissance. It's those 20 guys that became CEOs and uh, the multiple number of people that became CFOs and, and you know, taken significant director positions. That That is what is truly rewarding in the legacy. And I think the biggest positive associated with that transaction is that it released those people. It let them move on because none of them would have moved on um, if we'd kept the organization. They all would have kept. They were incredibly loyal um, and committed people. But this almost acted as opening the floodgates and letting them explore and grow their potential. It was the year 2000, if I'm correct. What were you thinking at the time? Were you thinking, I want to go start a company now and be an entrepreneur? I I can't remember exactly what you did next, but... What so, did you do? Um, I took some time off, a couple of months off, and then um, started looking for another opportunity. And that's where, as, as we'd gotten towards the end of Renaissance, it had gotten more challenging to grow. Those exploitation opportunities that the inventory of undeveloped ideas on side of big companies' assets were limited. Uh, that was a game that now was being chased by a lot of others. And I thought, okay, can I really effectively deploy 100% of cash flow back into an asset or – should I be looking for a financial vehicle that will have um, the flexibility to allow me to return um, capital to shareholders? And um, so I worked with some people over at Storm. We split out a company called Focus Energy Trust, which you know, had some natural gas assets in it, very low decline on those assets, very low sustaining capital uh, associated. And any free cash flow above and beyond that um, obviously could be returned to shareholders. So we became a very unique trust, one that was that instead of the acquire and go out and finance the asset, we we took a different approach to it and said um, we don't need management companies. Uh, you know that we can run this with a standard oil and gas um, type of compensation structure um, and. We are also in a position to be able to, if we do this right and we find the right sort of assets, we should be able to distribute free cash flow to shareholders and maintain our production uh, flat. And we were very successful doing that. We um, had an asset up in northeastern BC. Um, we bought an asset from Clayton Wojtas' company called Profico at the time and bolted that on and – in 2007, 2008, we turned around and sold that company for 1.7 times NAV after having distributed 400 million of cash flow to our shareholders. And we only ever raised $25 million. And I, I think th- that was important because we perfected the model um, and demonstrated that the model that you see a lot of companies, especially today, where shareholders have demanded a return of capital, that gave me the very clear parameters for success in in that type of environment. You need a low decline asset. You can't have an asset with a thirty or forty percent uh, decline. You it's a bit of a treadmill. You'll never be able to keep up with capital. You always need external capital. Did you view yourself as a engineer? Did you maybe you were an entrepreneur, a capital allocator? You're just trying to pay your bills, pay the mortgage off. How did you view yourself at the time? Um, you know, I, uh, well, of course, I can cash this any way I want in hindsight, yeah. which, you know, I think <laughs> is, a, is, you know, is a, <clears throat> an occupational hazard. Um, and I think, you know, it'd be interesting if you went and asked people that I worked with, they would tell you, this guy's your engineer's engineer. I, I would say to you that there's nothing I've done. Um, I've always wanted to do something different and bring something innovative to whatever I've done. Going out and doing the same thing or creating um, or d- doing a redo of what you've done. So, you know, I started my career back at Penn Canadian years ago, and I'm pretty sure we did the first multi-stage frack one Saturday afternoon uh, just north of Brooks. 
There is a CIM paper out there with my name on it that describes that and sort of the trials and tribulations in terms of trying to get reservoir engineers to understand that it wasn't acceleration, that it was actually incremental recovery. At Renaissance, we drilled the first 10 horizontal wells in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. At Focus Energy Trust, it was, let's try a different type of financial model and let's see if we can um, make that work and prove that that's uh, an innovation as we go forward. So one of the hallmarks I'd like to say is not so much how I describe myself, but more importantly, because those are words. What are the actions? What did I do in any of these timeframes that uh, provided uh, any sort of, um, that would be different or important, not only in that time frame, but uh, as important going forward in terms of shaping how this basin uh, has been exploited. This is uh, going back a little bit, but you were an engineer with um, probably a lot, a lot of opportunities at the time. How come you chose energy with a kind of innovative mindset? What brought you to this sector? So, you know, the uh, the there's there's two things one it's the the climate in calgary um not the temperature uh <laughs> it's the um the entrepreneurial nature uh the innovative and the ability to try things and the one thing that's very different about the oil and gas business as opposed to the power business or some of these other businesses you know whether you were right or wrong very quickly and the payout on um investments you know can be as short as 2 years we're not building a power project here that may pay out in 10 years and, you know, has no risk. So, you know, I I make the joke that, you know, people in Calgary wear cowboy boots because we can stuff more risk into them. But I wanted to work in a business where you were going to have to be imaginative, nimble, um, then you were were managing risk and the associated opportunities. And, you know, hopefully the compensation uh, would uh, represent a, a, a meaningful return for the risk that you took. Calgary's known for being an entrepreneurial center, but the thing people often do is we only look back at the winners. If you look back in your career and you look at the, all the entrepreneurial activity that's occurred in the sector in the city, would you say there's more winners than losers? And and how do you define success in that sense? You know, so um, yeah, that's an interesting question because I would argue that there's more to be garnered and won in a loser than there is in a winner. Um, winners create, it's good. It's, it's, it's great that people are successful, but I think, I don't know how many dry holes that were drilled in Western Canada before somebody, somebody had the perseverance and tenacity to say, I believe, I think we've got to do it. And then they found that oil. So I'm, I'm a, bigger believer that, you know, some of the things that don't go as well in your life as you would like, those tend to shape you more than having success. And I go back to the high school football star, you know, um, where is that individual today? Early success, success in itself can be very, very damaging. A lot of times it's uh, looking in the graveyard. You learn a lot from uh, what didn't work out, maybe. <laughs> oh, tons and tons of stuff. And, you know, I, for instance, you know, if we were to talk about hydrogen today, How many drill stem tests, how many wells have been drilled? How many things have been tested for natural gas, you know, and wells abandoned for whatever reason? Did any of those wells have hydrogen in them, naturally occurring hydrogen? We don't know because the technology and the test equipment we would use or had no ability to figure out whether hydrogen was actually present in commercial quantities. We didn't think it was a commercial sort of activity. You know, as we think about what the next generation of opportunities could be inside of this basin, they're multiple, but sometimes they're, those opportunities are based on things that we never thought were going to be important um, or we never looked for or never understood. You were aware of the entrepreneurial culture in Calgary and did you realize that once you got here? Or did you know that before you moved out here? So when I came out, As a 14-year-old, and I'm the eldest of six kids, so, you know, on the farm where we spent our summers, um, the eldest got to drive the biggest piece of equipment, and my father shipped me out west to work for a friend of his that ran a ranch down around Staveley. 
And, you know, this is a little known fact, but I was actually um, involved in AI long before it became a, uh, you know, a run of the mill type of uh, thing, but um, not artificial intelligence, artificial insemination. So I bred <laughs> cattle as a 14 year old for, uh, uh, in the morning and in the evening and during the day, I was responsible for bailing hay. But it was very clear to me, um, based on that, that period of time, and I came back for a number of years, was this was the place to be. And at that point, I hadn't decided I wanted to be in energy. I, the, you know, the sort of the, the key things from my perspective, one is I want to work in an environment where it, it was going to be entrepreneurial and innovative. And you could tell that by looking around and understanding how the stampede had developed, how, um, you know, you could get that feeling very quickly. But the challenge came down to me is I, you know, I was going to, ended up going to university in Eastern Canada and there was no um, oil and gas program. The closest thing to sort of resource exploitation was the mining business. So I um, I got involved in the mining business. Well, maybe to fast forward to today, you were the CEO of Meg Energy. Mm -hmm. um, for the listener, to get it right from the source, what is Meg Energy? Meg Energy is a pure play Alberta company. So, you know, we don't have any assets anywhere else in the world uh, or Canada. Um, we're only in Alberta. We're an in situ oil sands producer. So we inject steam into the ground to warm up our a very heavy oil slash bitumen, um, reduce the viscosity and uh, be able to produce that uh, water as the steam condenses and that oil back. And um, so we produce about 110,000 barrels a day of uh, bitumen and, uh, you know, have one asset at Christina Lake, which has a 50 year reserve life and another asset at Sermont, which we haven't developed yet, but we are, the only pure play um, oil sands player. And we're uh, the other thing that is, I think, defining and differentiating about Meg is that we're also one of six companies involved in the Pathways Alliance, which is a major project to decarbonize the oil sands um, on a scope one, scope two basis. If I'm correct, you are the top insider owner of Meg. Did you feel it was important to put your own money into the company along the way to create a symmetry of risk with investors? Absolutely. You cannot, I, I often tell people the only long-term shareholder in a, a company should be, and hopefully is, is the CEO. I mean, you should be growing your share position as, as the CEO, um, as long as you're in the seat. And, um, you can't ask, you know, I, I guess it, I find it very challenging to tell other people that they should be an investor in the company if they have, um, if they don't see that I've got, a, you have a significant ownership position. The nice thing about the oil sands is that you more or less know the reserves are there and that's the point. The oil's there and you have this massive asset. But on the other hand, how do you, preserve optionality in the business to keep your options open, so to speak. Is it drilling techniques or or how do you approach that? So, you know, I, I think one of the things that as you think about in situ or SAGD, steam assisted gravity drainage, which is the technique, you need to look at how mature that is. So if we think about the fracking industry, okay, you know, um, that thing's been around since the end of the Second World War when all these surplus engines from these World War II airplanes were available and some bright guy put one on some uh, pumps and we started uh, fracking wells. Well, that was over 80 years ago. And that business has totally changed. And now we're doing trimo fracks in the, uh, the Permian. So the technology continued over those 80 years to change, modify, you know, instead of airplane engines, now we run uh, big electric engines. The oil sands business, the in situ oil sands business, SAGD business has only been basically operating for 17 years. So the optionality in the business is in the, in the future technology that's going to be deployed. You know, today we burn natural gas to create steam. What about solvents? What about uh, small modular nuclear reactors to generate, um, you know, both uh, steam and, um, and electricity? I, I mean, the running room on this technology um, is substantial, I think. But the only way you, 
sort of the critical aspect of that is it's great that you've got running room on the technology, but do you actually have the asset base that is going to be able to, um, that you're going to be able to create value on that? And as, as you look at the oil sands, not just at, at Meg, but in other companies, we have substantial inventories, which make investments, continuing ongoing investments in innovation in that technology, very, very worthwhile and ultimately very profitable. Sometimes you you don't know what you don't know. And the nice thing about the oil sands is just so much inventory. You don't hold back on development, but do you think about that? That maybe 10 years from now, there may be this brand new technology that'll make recovery even better. How do you approach that? So, you know, I, I think it comes back to how do you steward your shareholders' money? And to me, that's you know, this industry has just gone through a very challenging period in the Permian where unfettered growth was um, allowed to happen with, you know, all the cash flow being reinvested and um, incremental debt being added or incremental equity uh, being provided to continue to try and do that. That was not a great return for many, many shareholders. And I, I think, you know, as I go back to my focus energy trust days, where if you chose the right asset with the low decline, you could sustain that production and you could generate free cash flow or return of, you know, fairly large return of capital programs. So as we look at the oil sands, the wonderful thing about them is that they've got very low declines. So very low declines, low sustaining capital, large free cash flow uh, for return of capital programs. And as I look at the opportunity and I understand what my shareholders want in turn recapital. I think it's a balance. So if you look at Meg today, we'll probably grow our production by about 4% on a year over year basis. But if you look at the amount, uh, number of shares that we could buy back, we could buy back this year, uh, 2024, probably 8% of our shares outstanding. Uh, so 8% production per share growth just by virtue of the buy buybacks and another 4% on actual organic production. That's a 12% production per share growth. I think, you know, we need to stop thinking about whether we put all money back, uh, all the money back into the ground and especially on an asset that has a long reserve life. You don't want to get going too quickly. Take your time. Put your capital to work efficiently, effectively, and don't be afraid to return uh, capital to your shareholders. Your time is valuable. What do you find is your best use of time? Is it reservoir analysis behind the computer screen? Is it pure decision making with your other executives? How do you how do you think about that? Oh, um, I think the 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 most valuable use of my time, and I'm going to be selfish here, is getting out and talking to um, employees. So the meeting we had before this was looking at, um, you know, how we were going to move barrels um, across the dock in that uh, um, with my marketing team um, on, on, on Trans Mountain. It was a fabulous meeting. Um, I learned a lot, you know, got a much better, better picture of what's going on. So it's, the most value added stuff for me, um, and I, I would hope that some value to our, our, our team members or employees is, um, having the opportunity to spend time with them either one on one in a coffee chat or, or in meetings. Sometimes when companies grow, they become bureaucratic and people spend a lot of time in meetings. How do you avoid burning your days in meetings that maybe not the most productive thing? Do you consciously make a decision to, for example, Warren Buffett reads all day long. He avoids meetings. That's the point. Do you make a decision to limit that sort of bureaucratic aspect of the business? Um, yeah, no, I, I don't think I could read all day long. I don't <laughs> like reading that much. Um, but what I do, you know, I, I'm a big believer that you're going to be the most effective in doing the things that you enjoy doing. Trying to pigeonhole yourself into what works for somebody else doesn't. So what works for me is the ability to get out and talk to people, be it shareholders, be it employees, getting to the field, wandering around, talking to the people that are working for us. So what gives me the greatest joy, and I would hope um, some degree of benefit to the people I interact with is the, um, the conversations that I have the opportunity to have with them. Dividends versus buybacks. Do you have a preference? Is or maybe you can't talk about, it, but is Meg leaning a particular way or does it depend or? that That's a great question. Um, and one that continues to be debated by our board of directors. What I would say about dividends is they become a permanent part of your cost structure. And one of the challenges with the 
the oil business is the volatility in the oil price. And one of the things that was driven into me by Clayton Oitis um, and others at uh, Renaissance is we need to be the lowest cost producer. The lowest cost producer will be able to survive when nobody else will. And that presents you with opportunities, but it also keeps you from going in the ditch and the bank coming knocking at the door. Challenge I have with dividends is that it adds, it will add cost to your basis. So our, our break even cost today, our sustaining break even cost is about $46 WTI. I don't want it to go above $50. And, you know, so we think about dividends. I would say a couple of quick other things. None of our shareholders today are in the story because of dividends. So if you were thinking about adding a dividend, I think the way to think about it is, do you think you are trading at a discount because you don't have a dividend? So is not having a dividend hurting your your trading premium or how you're you're viewed in the world? If it is, well then you should make you should think about a dividend. If it isn't, then I think, you know, sort of moving down that hierarchy, the next thing you need to think about, well, is it going to increase your liquidity? Is it going to bring a number of other people that aren't there? And if you answer yes to that, okay, well then you should drive on and how long do you think that process would take? So there are a number of considerations there. We traded a, a pretty strong premium today. I don't think not having a dividend has hurt us. And it's going to be an interesting discussion as we get closer to that $600 million uh, US debt target that we have. Like you said, some companies trade at a premium. The management team, maybe like yourself, is valued in the market. From your perspective, what attributes lead to that premium? Is it just trust with investors or is it a track record? I, you know, there, there's, there's many different things that I think investors, individual investors value, but track record is the most important from my perspective. If we say we're going to do something and it's going to cost this much money and it's going to be done by this time, you need to deliver on that. And the more you deliver on that, the more you will be seen to be an honest broker and somebody that they can rely on, investors can rely on to steward their capital in an appropriate fashion. There's a lot of big fish out there. And although Meg is big, there are others in the market that may recognize the value of Meg. And uh, at times it's been undervalued. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that, or maybe you had to fend off offers, or how do you ensure that bigger fish offer you the correct value for the company if they come along? And how do you think about that going forward? Well, you know, I've, I've been here for a uh, little over five and a half years. And three weeks into the job, Husky showed up uh, with a hostile bid and uh, tried to take the company over. They weren't successful at the end of the day, but it created an environment where Meg had a huge amount of debt at that point in time and was vulnerable to um, other people looking at the asset base and going, wow, this is a pretty wonderful asset base. And, you know, we could we could pick this up quite cheaply. We've worked really hard to continue to build the um, valuation of the company in terms of marketing it and getting it brought back into investor scopes as, as being a sustainable company, um, one that's living inside of its cash flow, one that's bringing its debt down from, you know, the, the highs down to, you know, the $600 million uh, debt target. And our, our valuation in comparison to our peers has continued to improve. And that has been the, the single best defense, uh, that we could, uh, we could have asked for, you know, so. Are there people out there that potentially could look at the company? Oh, yeah. But it's gotten incrementally more harder for them to be able to put together an accretive story as to how they would fundamentally explain to their shareholders why they had to pay, what they had to pay to to acquire a target like ours. We're not looking to be bought out. We've got lots of runway, nor are we looking to buy other assets. I mean, you know, when you've got a 50-year reserve life, you know, you'd have a very hard time explaining to your shareholders why you went out and bought another company, which is very different than what's happening in the States today. If you look at those transactions, they're all about extending reserve life indexes. That is not going to be dry, what drives M&A transactions actions um, in the oil sense, from my perspective. Everybody has a reserve life of at least 30 to 35 years. So, 
you don't worry about a big fish from the States coming up to refill the hopper, so to speak. No, I, I'd be very surprised with that. I, I think the oil sands is a bit of a unique beast. You know, ConocoPhillips obviously owns a fairly significant oil sands um, assets, but I, I don't think you're likely to see that. I think M&A um, activity inside of the oil sands will be between oil sands comp- existing oil sands companies that – understand the unique and positive values of of those assets. But I'd be really surprised if a U.S. company showed up at the door um, or showed up in the the space. Knowing that reserves are there, you kind of touched on it earlier, but from your perspective, how do you create the most value to get the value out of the oil that you know is there already for shareholders? Is it, like you said, just cost reduction, or is it creating good culture in the company? How do you think of it that way? It's it's all of the uh, above. If you created a circle, not unlike a clock face, and at every you know at one o'clock or two o'clock or three o'clock, you said there was a value added activity. It would be drilling or completion or marketing or pipelines or ESG or culture. All of those elements, all the way around the clock. You can't just focus on one. You've got to focus them on them all. So, you know, one of the things that is unique about this company is the amount of long haul transportation we have to the U.S. Gulf Coast, which is the primary market, um, export market and refining market for our, our product. We've had that for a long time. That's been a differentiator. Our barrels going to the U.S. Gulf Coast typically achieve a premium valuation to those being sold in Alberta. So that's an example. On the the drilling side in the last year, you know, we saw 10% increases in the cost of drilling services. But when we are, you know, our amazing team sort of worked that on a dollar per meter basis, our costs increased by 1%. So it's Everybody in the organization has some responsibility in terms of continuing to make sure that we're a low cost producer, but it's at all stops along that clock face that value is created and giving people the opportunity to demonstrate that they can, how they can add value and making sure that you're not putting up or creating barriers to, to innovation in the organization is pretty important. Some would say the IP in the energy industry is limited at times because it's shared so frequently and quickly. And do you view that the same way? Or is there a lot of innovation that really drives the development in the oil sands that helps create value? You know, I don't think there's a lot of proprietary innovation. What the differentiating element is, is on whether companies want to take risk, whether they want to try things. Are you a, a leader, not a bleeding edge leader, but are you a leader in putting to new technology to work? Or are you a follower? Because the leader will always be in a much better position in terms of figuring out what works, what doesn't work, and continuing to have that leadership position in terms of the the next leg of the journey that they go on to either improve the recovery factor or think about how to continue to you know expand the boundaries of the business. A couple questions from Twitter. Sure. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, this one's from Arjun Murthy. His question, cost of supply. What is your cost of supply for incremental brownfield expansion? Do you have a number off the top of your head or yeah. what goes into that? So cost of supply, it's pretty unique to us. So, you know, we have a central processing facility, which you should think of as a major factory. We don't have to build a new one of these every two years as we move from a different part to the field. It's all connected. So our cost of supply is relatively low in comparison to our peers in the, in the conventional business. It's about $20,000 of flowing BOE. It's largely as a result of having that, that central processing facility, as long as there's capacity in that to add incremental supply, you have very low cost. Another question, the pros and cons of remaining a uh, pure oil sands company Do you think about it expanding into other areas? I think you mentioned already you don't, but have you thought about that? We've thought about that. We look at other assets that are available out there and there's some that we think are are very good. The ones we tend to think are very good are also very expensive. And I'll give you an example of the Clearwater play. We think that's a fabulous play. But when we look at companies and where some of the very best with some of the very best inventory trade, and it's like $100,000 of flowing BOE, I'm going to get crucified by my my shareholders if I go out and pay $100,000 of flowing BOE for something that's very good, but and has inventory, they're going to say, well, what's wrong with our 50 years of inventory and our 
or supply cost of $20,000 of flowing BOE. So I guess the point I want to make is we can recognize good value in other assets. We just can't find a reasonable way to bring those into the mix. Um, and I, I think the biggest challenges is when you have a resource that is as high quality as ours is and that has that long reserve life, it's very hard to create a situation where you believe that there's anything accretive out there. And I guess the other thing I would say, don't take my word for it that it's a good asset. Okay. <laughs> Go and look at the steam oil ratio. The steam oil ratio is a proxy for the thickness of the reservoir, the quality of the reservoir, the bitumen saturation. You will see that there are two people on a steam oil ratio chart that have the lowest ones, and both of them happen to be on either side of Christina Lake, one of which is us. Your time at Pengrowth, what lessons and experience did you learn from the Lindbergh idea and how has it helped Meg? So Lindbergh, um, at Pengrowth, Lindbergh was the first SEG D asset that uh, Pengrowth had ever uh, developed. Um, it was, well, not Pengrowth, but that team had ever developed. And it was, uh, we brought it on, on time and on budget and produced over nameplate capacity right out of the chutes. I think the things we learned was make sure that you can build the facility with lots of optionality and make sure that, you know, you're developing the best parts of the reservoir first, um, because those are going to help you can get the momentum and the cash flow to continue to, to build that out. But it was built in a very different fashion than, than sort of the uh, more Northern cousins, uh, were built with it very much a, um, instead of using one through steam generators, they use the evaporators technology that had been borrowed from the pulp and paper industry. And we went looking for technologies different technologies than what they, you know, the industry players were using because we knew this was going to be a cost filled business. So we went to look, or it was going to be costly to do things the way they had done it in the past. And we went to pulp and paper industry um, as a, you know, business that has to purify water and clean water up in their processes, which is exactly what you do at an oil sands facility. But we went to look for somebody that had been under significant sort of stresses from a financial perspective. We thought, okay, you're going to find the cheapest and the best solution with somebody that's really had to scrape up the nickels and dimes. And the evaporator technology was something that uh, we incorporated and uh, was a significant in terms of all sorts of. Of, um, aspects of how you purify water to create steam, which is the the secret sauce to help uh, reduce the viscosity in the bitumen. I know you can't talk about it much in terms of Meg, but does M and A continuing the sector going forward? Do you view it as a good thing? And what are your thoughts on that? You know, it, it's it, it's directly limited to the horizon that you're looking at. I, I mean, if you don't believe there's anything beyond what we have today, well, then what you're looking at M and A is consolidation, and you make bigger companies. I happen to think that there is a huge opportunity in Western Canada with its existing reservoirs, its storage base, its its carbon capture and storage initiatives. We should be the home for many, many primary industries that use hydrocarbons or need hydrocarbons to create the energy that they use, where we can bolt on carbon capture and storage. We should become a manufacturing destination for steel, for people that want to use hydrogen. We have got all the makings of the next two or three generations of what our resource base is going to give to us. But again, it depends on where you're looking. If you're looking at your toes, you can answer that M&A question in a very, this is not good for the industry. If you're looking out at the horizon and saying, oh, that's fine. Consolidation inside of the existing business as we know it is, is fine. But what are the next opportunities? We're not at the end of the road by any stretch of the imagination. There's huge opportunities on the, the renewables front. As we think about hydrogen, as we think about carbon capture and storage, we should, and we have no reason not to be a leader on all of those. Well, I guess to end on a, on a lighter note, favorite time in your career thus far? Favorite time in my career thus far? You know, <laughs> I have had, I can't answer that question. I ha, It's been such a joy to work in this business and to have had the opportunity to work with 
the incredible people that I have had the opportunity to work with. There are few, very few days where I go home and go, oh man, that was tough. You know, I, I use a very simple formula um, in life is, do you give me energy or do you take energy away from me? And it's, it's a very poor pun, but this business has provided me with endless joy and energy and continued enthusiasm for what the future holds. Advice for a young person entering the energy industry or business in general, what would you tell them? I would tell them if you're thinking about the energy industry, jump right in now, because no matter what people are saying about how this is things going to transition, this will be lo around for far longer than you will be alive. And you have an opportunity to be very impactful and to make a difference, not only in terms of creating energy that not only do the 1 billion people in the developed countries use, but the 7 billion that are um, in the undeveloped part of the world are going to actually want to have access to you can play a significant social role above and beyond what you can do inside the Western Canadian sphere. The other thing, a piece of advice that I would give young people is don't hold back, show initiative, show that you want to be part of the solution and step forward and, and be part of that. There's huge opportunities, but in many instances, you know, depending on where you are in terms of the structure of the organization, it's hard to get noticed. Showing some initiative will differentiate you very quickly from some of your peers. Also, maybe just to wrap up, how much does May contribute to the Alberta and Canadian economy on an annual basis? I, we've got about 700 employees, uh, contractors and, and full-time employees. As I said, you know, we only operate in uh, the province of Alberta. So any money we spend, any money our employees spend all stays inside of Canada and I can tell you that the oil sands business as a whole, um, in terms of royalties and taxes, uh, I think in 2023 will likely contribute $30 billion to the Alberta Treasury. You know, we're a small part of that, but we're a proud part of that and substantially less to the uh, the federal government, but proportionally far more than the, the six major banks would when you think about the six major oil sands companies. Wow, that's awesome. I really appreciate your time. We can end the formal conversation there. So Alrighty. thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you like what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, happy coffee drinking. Happy coffee drinking.